I would like to thank the organisers of this conference and Physiotherapy New Zealand for inviting me to speak on the diagnosis of sacroiliac joint pain. When putting this presentation together, I wanted to very briefly summarise some of the important facts about anatomy and biomechanics, and in the end chose to use part of an excellent public domain video and overdub my audio using the same words as the American authors. We will briefly review the characteristics and biomechanics of the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint is the connection between the spine and the pelvis. The SI joint is a true diarthroidal joint. The articular surfaces are L-shaped and contain irregular ridges and depressions. Its concave sacral surface is covered with thick hyaline cartilage and its convex iliac surface lined with thin fibrocartilage. Biomechanically, the SI joint's movement is induced by motion occurring in other locations in the body. This movement is very small, with less than 4 degrees of rotation and less than 1.6 millimeters of translation. While the SI joint is vulnerable to shear during rotation or translation, compression of the joint allows it to resist shear. Those structures that produce joint compression include the interosseous ligaments and the joint capsule, including strong posterior ligaments protecting the network of adjacent nerves. In addition, a number of muscles contract and co-contract to provide stabilization for the SI joint during movement. Next, I would like to clarify some terms frequently used in discussion about the sacroiliac joint. I specifically want to differentiate between sacroiliac joint pain and sacroiliac joint dysfunction. These terms do not refer to the same phenomena and should not be used interchangeably. I use the, the term sacroiliac joint pain to mean pain arising from nociceptor receptor activity within the structures of the sacroiliac joint, which may be intra or extra articular. I use the terms sacroiliac joint dysfunction in reference to concepts of disturbed, abnormal or aberrant function of the sacroiliac joint. It is best used as a biomechanical concept and for clarity's sake I will only use the term when I am talking about non-painful mechanical aberrations from normal. The concept of sacroiliac joint dysfunction from my perspective is dependent on two issues a view of what is normal and whether departures from so-called normal are a problem generally or in any given individual. There has been a lot of work on the question of possible cause-effect relationships between structural and functional observations and pain. This 1985 paper by Gretchen Dieck et al. reports on a study that began in the years 1957 through 1959. Digitized from nude photographs of college aged women without a history of back or neck pain, the researchers measured asymmetries of shoulder or hip height and departures of the spine from the midline. They then followed up these women some 25 years later and interviewed them regarding spinal pain. They found no relationship between asymmetries of form and development of subsequent neck or back pain. And this study is by no means unique. There are many others that reach similar conclusions. For example, it is known that minor or moderate idiopathic scoliosis is not a predictor of future back pain. In theory though, sacroiliac joint dysfunction could cause sacroiliac joint or other structures to produce pain. And, in theory, sacroiliac joint pain could cause the sacroiliac joint to move in an abnormal way and cause pain. Also in theory, sacroiliac joint pain and dysfunction could coexist. This is theory though. What about evidence? Specifically, what about evidence regarding functions like range of motion? 
Range of motion in the sacroiliac joint has been studied and the best example of the research is now nearly 30 years old. This paper by Bent Sturrison et al. was published in 1989. These researchers implanted small tantalum metal balls into the bones of the sacrum and ilia of a cohort of patients with unilateral pain believed to be caused by a sacroiliac joint problem. They measured range of motion using a sophisticated stereoscopic x-ray technology that allowed accurate measurement of very small amounts of movement occurring between the sacrum and ileum. They found that the sacroiliac joint does indeed move, but only in small amounts, less than 4 degrees of rotation and less than a millimetre of translation. Furthermore, they measured the painful and non-painful sides and found that there was no significant difference between the symptomatic and asymptomatic sides. The suggestion here is that pain assumed to be of sacroiliac joint origin is not related to movements that can be perceived using this highly standardized and sensitive technique. The question then arises, can we as clinicians detect these small ranges of motion? Most specifically using the palpation techniques that are still taught in many places throughout the world. The short answer is no. So-called expert clinicians cannot agree with each other and there does not appear to be supportive evidence that these unreliable palpation tests can predict the results of a reference standard for sacroiliac joint pain. Without presenting you with the chapter and verse of the mostly consistent data, I like to use this neat slide from my friend and colleague David Poulter, where he says rather neatly that, quotes, trying to palpate sacroiliac joint motion is like trying to read braille through a rump steak, unquote. The layer of tissue overlying the bony landmarks used in sacroiliac joint palpation is at least half an inch thick, even in the thinnest patients. These tissues move independently of the bones and almost certainly confound interpretation. We do indeed feel something, but certainly not what the theory and our minds think we are feeling. Sacroiliac joint pain, on the other hand, is well researched, documented, and proven to be theoretically and existentially possible. The reference standard test for intraarticular sacroiliac joint pain is guided and controlled intraarticular local anesthetic injection that ablates the patient's usual pain. This is what a good sacroiliac joint arthrogram looks like. You can see that the contrast lies within the joint space, from the inferior location of the inserted needle to the superior aspect of the joint. Where the contrast is, is also where there is local anaesthetic. The guidance in this case was under fluoroscopy. Guidance may also be under CT as well. All of my lumbar spine diagnostic studies have used fluoroscopic guidance. Guidance only ensures that the needle and injectate are in fact in the location desired, in this case the intraarticular space. These guided injections need to be controlled because of known false positive responses from patients. More on that later. The control may be a placebo injection or what is called a comparative control. A placebo control is where the patient receives two injections at different times but reasonably close together, where one is a placebo and the other is a local anaesthetic. Obviously, in a true positive case, the placebo will not ablate the pain, whereas the local anaesthetic will. A comparative control is where the effects of a long-acting versus a short-acting anaesthetic injection is compared. This diagnostic test procedure is the best means of confirming or rejecting the diagnosis of intraarticular sacroiliac joint pain. That is why it is called the reference or a criterion standard. However, it is minimally invasive in that needles are inserted, drugs injected, and there is exposure to radiation. It is also a highly skilled procedure requiring a physician to undergo extensive and expensive training. This training is available across much of the world by the Spinal Intervention Society. That is not the problem. The problem is that we need a simpler, less invasive method that tells us 
that a sacroiliac joint is the probable source of pain. We need a method that may be used in primary care with minimal or no specialised equipment. This is what we sought to achieve when we started our research program in the early 1990s. These are the tests you probably know as the provocation sacroiliac joint tests. This is the distraction test. This is the thigh thrust test. This is Gainsland's pelvic torsion test. This is the compression test. And this is the sacral thrust test. So, what is the diagnostic accuracy of these tests? Just how reliable are they? That is, do different practitioners get the same test result when examining the same patient? Can clinicians agree on the results of these tests? The first study we did was a simple one of inter-examiner reliability, and this was published in the Spine Journal in 1994. We didn't publish 95 confidence intervals, but the whole data set was published, so these and other statistics such as PABAC can be calculated from the published data. You can see the percent agreement and the Kappa statistic for each of the tests, and also the common interpretation of the Kappa statistic. Kappa values over 0 0.4 are considered high enough as a threshold for clinical utility. This systematic review by Peter van der Werf and co-workers was published in 2000 and they concluded that in general the palpation and motion demand tests were not reliable whereas the pain provocation tests were. This more recent paper by Robertson et al published in 2007 reports on a study of a number of other provocation tests and these too were found to possess satisfactory inter-examiner reliability. Now this is all very good and useful, but reliability is not validity. A reliable test may simply fail to identify those cases with the problem for which the test is designed, or it may be false positive. That is, the test may be positive when the patient does not have the condition the test is designed for. This is a different sort of study entirely. These reliable tests have been evaluated for diagnostic accuracy against the results of the reference standard test. In this case, the reference standard test is guided and controlled intra-articular sacroiliac joint blocks. This is what we set out to do in 1996. The study was carried out in New Orleans in the diagnostic clinic of Dr. Charles April, who is one of the founders of the Spinal Intervention Society and is acknowledged as one of the needle jockey gurus on planet Earth. I examined about a third of the cases and my colleague and co-worker Sharon Young examined two-thirds. Here we have the sensitivity and specificity values for the tests. The distraction test has 81% specificity and 60% sensitivity. It is the most specific test. The compression test has just under 70% sensitivity and specificity. The thigh thrust test is the most sensitive at 88% and has a specificity of 69%. Gainsland's pelvic torsion tests have the poorest individual diagnostic accuracy and the sacral thrust test has 75% sensitivity and 63% specificity. These results are not bad, but not brilliant either. In truth, we should never take clinical tests out of the context in which they are used. In actual clinical practice, we almost never look at a test on its own and make a diagnostic decision from that singular piece of data. For example, a rheumatologist does not look at the HLA-B27 antigen result and decide if a patient has or does not have ankylosing spondylitis on the basis of that test result alone. There is a huge amount of additional data required before such a diagnosis can be made. This is also true of other diagnoses including sacroiliac joint pain. What we do is look at multiple provocation tests. The more that are positive, the more likely a sacroiliac joint pain problem is going to be, right? Well, we have looked at that too. 
Here we will look at clusters of sacroiliac joint provocation tests and their accuracy in relation to the reference standard test. Each one of these blue columns is the estimated sensitivity of one or more positive tests, two or more positive tests, three or more, four or more, and five or more. As is typical of diagnostic accuracy studies, the more stringent the diagnostic diagnostic criteria, the lower the sensitivity. This means that the proportion of patients who are positive to the reference standard gets smaller as the test cluster increases in complexity. In this example, only 27% of patients with confirmed sacroiliac joint pain had five or more positive provocation tests, whereas all patients had at least one positive test. The opposite pattern is seen with specificity, seen as the yellow columns. Specificity is less than 50% where the test cluster consists of only one out of the five positive tests. This means that 56% of patients who do not have confirmed sacroiliac joint pain had at least one positive provocation test. Conversely, 68% with confirmed sacroiliac joint pain have five or more positive provocation tests. It so happens that prior to the study we had found, anecdotally, that the optimum clinical rule for concluding a sacroiliac joint pain was three or more positive sacroiliac joint provocation tests, and this proved to be correct. The optimal overall diagnostic utility was for three or more positive tests. Let's look at the numbers more closely now. When we compare the cluster of three or more positive sacroiliac joint provocation tests against the reference standard of guided and controlled intraarticular sacroiliac joint blocks, the sensitivity was 91% and specificity was 78%. This produces a likelihood ratio of 4.2. This means that those patients satisfying this simple three or more positive test cluster rule are 4.2 times more likely to have a sacroiliac joint source of pain confirmed by the, the reference standard than those who would have the diagnosis rejected by the reference standard. We were rather happy with this result and even happier when a couple of years later Peter van der Werf and colleagues published the results of their study which was at least as robust as our own. The results were so similar it was also rather spooky. So unusual was the similarity, we wrote a letter to the editor of Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, commenting on the amazingly close diagnostic accuracy values the two different studies produced. This sort of similarity is almost never seen in musculoskeletal medicine. But I want to state clearly that Van der Werf's study was a completely independent study carried out in a different country on a different cohort of patients, with the provocation tests being carried out by clinicians I have never met or personally trained, and the reference standard test was carried out by physicians previously unknown to us. This is validation. Having established the reliability and useful validity of the provocation tests, specifically the clusters of tests, we must now turn to the question as to how often these tests are positive in a back pain population. We do have unpublished data from my two clinics here in Auckland, acquired during the 1990s. These clinics were primary care environments and so are probably representative of the patients you are likely to see in your own clinics. In a sample of 202 consecutive patients presenting with low back and or referred lower extremity pain, 19% had a positive distraction test. The Gainsons pelvic torsion tests were present in about 15%. One of the thigh thrust tests was positive in 40%, and both were positive in about 9%. The compression test was positive in 15%, and the sacral thrust positive in a third of the cases. The frequency of positive provocation tests was definitely higher than the expected prevalence of sacroiliac joint pain, which confirmed our suspicion that the tests were false positive much of the time. We suspected this because patients who clearly had prolapsed discs 
causing radicular pain and radiculopathy commonly have a few positive provocation tests. Also, patients whose symptoms can be made to centralise with the McKenzie Repeated Movement Assessment also often have positive tests that become negative after the symptoms have centralised. We believe that the centralisation of pain was a symptom behaviour associated with discogenic pain. We now know that not only is centralisation associated with discogenic pain, it is highly specific to it. So these observations led us to arrive at a reasonable clinical decision rule that in order to reduce the problem of false positive sacroiliac joint provocation tests, we should only apply the rule of three or more provocation tests positive in those cases where there is no evidence of radicular pain or radiculopathy and when symptoms cannot be centralised during the McKenzie Repeated Movement Assessment. We did formally test that hypothesis of this clinical decision rule in the study we conducted in the late 1990s, and the results were published in 2003. This paper should be well known to most of you now, but let's take a quick look at the diagnostic accuracy statistics of the full clinical diagnostic decision rule. So what is the accuracy of applying the three or more positive provocation tests in only non-centralizers? As you can see, the sensitivity is the same at 91%. But it is also apparent that the specificity is 87%, whereas applying the rule to all patients results in a specificity of 78%. This 11% improvement in specificity is a direct consequence of reducing the false positive rate and results in a meaningful improvement in overall diagnostic accuracy. The likelihood of the full diagnostic decision rule is just under 7 compared to 4.2 when the 3 or more rule is applied to all back pains. It also means that if you want to actually achieve this level of diagnostic accuracy, you have to learn how to carry out the McKenzie Repeated Movement Assessment consistently and learn how to properly interpret patient responses. The best place to do that is within the formal McKenzie Institute training program. So let's summarize the full diagnostic decision rule and reasoning process. Assuming the patient does not have radicular pain and radiculopathy, the first step is to ascertain if the patient is a centralizer or not, or if there is a clear directional preference observed during the repeated movement assessment. If the patient is a centralizer or shows clear directional preference, then the patient is highly likely to have discogenic pain. We know this from our own studies comparing clinical examinations to control provocation discography. In our publications of 2005 and 2006, we showed that centralization has 100% specificity in non-distressed patients. Even in severely disabled and distressed patients, the specificity of centralization in relation to provocation discography was over 80%. If the patient is a non-centralizer, the next question is, are there three or more positive sacroiliac joint provocation tests? If there are, then the patient is most likely to have pain arising from the sacroiliac joint, and the overall accuracy of that decision is about 80%. If there are less than three positive sacroiliac joint provocation tests, the probability of pain being intraarticular sacroiliac joint origin actually plummets. You can, in fact, reasonably rule out the sacroiliac joint as a source of pain. You must then look elsewhere for the source of pain. These clinical tests that I have described are arguably reliable and valid. But are there other tests that may be useful in clinical practice? After all, there are circumstances when some of the regular tests cannot be done in the normal way. For example, the sacral thrust test is inappropriate for women who are pregnant. They may not be able to lie prone at all. 
Also, Gainsland's tests or the thigh thrust tests may not be advisable in patients with a prosthetic total hip replacement, for example. It so happens that we did evaluate Patrick's Faber test, and I can tell you that this test may be substituted for any one of the other tests. It is both reliable and valid. The heel bump or drop test is reliable, but I am unaware of any study that has assessed its validity against the appropriate reference standard test. However, as a general rule, I would argue that pain provocation tests are, with appropriate standardization, reliable and probably valid for the structure they test. There is one test that I developed in the 1990s, which I call the belt test. It has never been evaluated for reliability, and I have very limited data on validity. I believe it may be useful, however, if properly carried out and standardized. I teach that in my courses, but I cannot claim that it is scientifically validated. The next issue to look at is the prevalence of sacroiliac joint pain. Well, the published data vary widely. Some estimates are as low as 10%, whereas others are as high as 62%. This variation is largely a function of the setting from which the data are acquired. Generally, however, the prevalence is accepted as about 20%. We do have some good data from a very specific and well-defined subset from the work of Annalie Gutke et al. These researchers examined over 300 pregnant women using the McKenzie assessment and the provocation tests. Some 62% of their cohort were experiencing some back and or pelvic girdle pain and in these cases they were able to categorize these patients into three subgroups. Those with pain arising from the lumbar spine alone, those who satisfy my clinical decision rule for sacroiliac joint pain and those whose pain is likely a combination of sacroiliac joint and lumbar spine pain. The data from Gutke et al. tell us that of women 12 to 18 weeks into a pregnancy with current back pain, 54% satisfy my criteria for sacroiliac joint pain and 17% do not. The remaining 29% probably have both sacroiliac joint and lumbar spine pain. It is clear that sacroiliac joint pain is the predominant feature of pregnancy-related pelvic girdle pain. From my own unpublished data, only 7% of patients presenting with back pain satisfied my clinical criteria for sacroiliac joint pain. Clearly, the setting matters and dependent on a number of factors. The probability that pain arises from the sacroiliac joint may be quite low or rather high. Now I'm going to give you an example of a patient who did indeed have a sacroiliac joint confirmed as the source of persistent and disabling pain. This is Christy, a 37 year old woman who was unemployed with one child. She had been experiencing two and a half years of pain that was progressively worsening. She reported slipping and falling onto her right hip and was knocked out in the fall. She immediately experienced right buttock pain and this had remained the dominant pain location ever since. The 23 question Roland Morris questionnaire score was 23 out of 23, categorizing her as severely disabled. The Zung depression questionnaire score was 39 out of 66, six points above the 33 out of 66 threshold, where it is accepted that clinical depression is a likely issue. The Modified Somatic Perception Questionnaire, or MSPQ, score was quite low at 6. The Zung and MSPQ scores can be used to categorize patients into four mutually exclusive distress categories. Normal, at risk, distress depressed, or distressed somatic. Christie was therefore categorized as distress depressed, according to this distress risk assessment method, the DRAM. Christie's pain intensity immediately before any physical examination or procedure was 87 out of 100, and she reported that her pain never fell to below 70 out of 100. 
and at its worst the pain was reported as 97 out of 100. Christy had received conservative care in the form of physical therapy and chiropractic. This consisted of exercises and manipulation, all without any significant reduction in pain. MR images of her lumbar spine had been acquired and were normal, and she had not undergone any relevant surgical procedure. This is Christie's pain drawing prior to my assessment, and you can see that the dominant pain was in the buttock and deeply through to the anterior hip region. You'll note that the pain intensity score here is written on the sheet at 87 out of 100. Christy reported being worst with sitting and best with side lying, left side lying. There was no effect on her pain when rising from a chair, and the standing extension rotation test provoked her typical pain. All of the sacroiliac joint provocation tests provoked her typical pain with minimal pressure, and all of the lumbar midline spring tests provoked typical pain too. The right straight leg raise test provoked her right buttock pain near end range, and the left straight leg raise test was 85 degrees and painless. The femoral nerve tension tests were negative, and a full neurologic screening examination did not reveal any evidence of radiculopathy, L1 through S2. I examined the hips too. There was a normal range of passive motion, but typical pain was provoked at the end of all ranges of motion. The Faber test was positive. The repeated movement testing procedure was completed and I was unable to induce centralization or peripheralization and there was no evidence of a directional preference. This clinical picture clearly indicated that a sacroiliac joint source of pain was highly likely. The clinical decision rule is indeed satisfied in Christie's case. This is Christie's pain drawing immediately after my clinical and physical examination. You can see that the pain distribution and dominance is essentially unchanged, as is the pain intensity, which remained at 86 out of 100. Here is an image of the sacroiliac joint arthrogram carried out immediately after my clinical examination. The injection consisted of contrast followed by local anaesthetic. You can see contrast accumulated in the inferior capsular region, the location of needle insertion. And you can see the contrast tracked throughout the joint space. The point is that the contrast confirms injectate spread, so you know where the anaesthetic is also distributed. This allows us to infer that the intra-articular sacroiliac joint structures have been injected with a local anaesthetic, and that the anaesthetic is probably confined to the sacroiliac joint. This is important. We know what has been anaesthetized. Here you see on the left the post-assessment pre-injection pain drawing and 100 mm VAS scale recording pain intensity at 86 out of 100. On the right you see Christie's pain drawing acquired 30 minutes after sacroiliac joint injection. All the referred pain has disappeared, including the dominant buttock and deep anterior thigh pain, and all that is left is some very mild midline mid-lumbar aching. That is essentially 100% pain ablation, at least of the primary symptoms. Christie went on to have a confirmatory sacroiliac joint injection some two weeks later, and the same outcome was recorded. She had comparative blocks and the duration of her reported pain relief was consistent with the known pharmacological properties of the local anaesthetics injected. I did not personally see Christy again, but Dr. April did, about a year after she had undergone a sacroiliac joint fusion based on the confirmed sacroiliac joint origin of her persistent and disabling pain. She re revisited Dr. April because of recurring mild and qualitatively different right buttock pain that seemed to coincide with her menstrual cycle. She was concerned about the sacroiliac joint fusion and underwent CT scanning. A good, solid and stable fusion was demonstrated and all of her usual pains that led her to seek treatment was essentially gone. 
At the time of the last assessment in 2003, she was very happy with the diagnostic and surgical outcome. She was working, able to look after her child, and was working out, guided by a personal trainer. In retrospect, I would say that by any measure, Christy had chronic pain, was almost certainly sensitized and distressed, but had a clinically identifiable pathoanatomic source of her persistent pain that was confirmed by appropriate controlled and guided interventional radiological means and was therefore successfully managed by an appropriate surgical intervention. It is unknown if she would or could have responded to a conservative care option. There are no published research data to argue the case for that one way or the other. To conclude now, I point you to my paper in the Journal of Manual and Manipulative Therapy, which is widely available, I believe. In this paper, I discuss all of the diagnostic processes in detail and also discuss possible conservative treatment options. So for more detailed information, have a look at the paper. This lecture will remain in the public domain on our website under the tab Open Access Material. You can also view descriptions of my courses and also those of Angela Cadogan on the shoulder. Again, I'd like to thank the Auckland and North Shore branches of Physiotherapy New Zealand for hosting this seminar day and inviting me to contribute.